Charles. So good afternoon and a warm welcome to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. For those who don't know me, I'm Sabine Schmidtke, the permanent faculty at the School of Historical Studies representing Near Eastern Studies. And co-hosting today's webinar with me is Maria Mercedes Tuya, representing Digital Scholarship at the IAS. We are glad you could join us and hope you're as excited as we are for learning of yet another door that has opened to promote and enhance scholarship by providing access to materials for now and for the generations to come, no matter where you are or where they will be. And it's a great pleasure for me now to introduce our speaker, uh, Kinga Devengi. She's Associate Professor of Arabic Language and Islamic Civilization at the Department of International Relations, the Corvinus University of Budapest. And she is the curator of Arabic and Hebrew manuscripts and the Goldseer and Kaufmann collections in the library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. The primary focus of Kinga's earlier research had been Arabic linguistics and the history of Arabic grammar, while her later publications reflect her, di her, her diverse areas of interest, ranging from Omani studies to Islamic law in the 20th and 21st centuries. Her recent publications include a catalog of the Arabic manuscripts in the library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, published with Brill in 2016, together with other articles and manuscript studies based on the Arabic manuscripts in the, of the Oriental collection of the same library. Kinga will speak to us today for about 60 minutes. Uh, this will leave us uh, with some 30 minutes for discussion in the end. Um, and please do type your questions and comments by using the chat function, addressing the panelists either during or after the presentation. And now without further ado, I pass the floor to Kinga. Thank you very much. Uh, I will share my screen. Yeah, so uh, probably I start in the meantime, and um, if there is no, um, is it is it already available to you? Yeah, great, thank you very much. So uh, the title of my talk is Hidden Gem of a Bygone Era, uh, and it's a polythematic work from the Rasulid era in Yemen. But first of all, I would like to express how honored and happy I feel to have been invited by Sabine to give a talk in this series and I do hope that you will not only find my presentation interesting, but it will also entice you to explore the hidden depth of the Oriental collection of the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in the future, as Maria uh, has already hinted on that, on this possibility. I also hope that uh, you are not misled by the title of my talk, which focuses only on one of its aspects, while the abstract you may have read covers more correctly its contents. I was also delighted to have heard during the past week the name of the Hungarian scholar Martin Schreiner mentioned in connection with Asherism uh, during uh, the previous talk uh, in this series on the basis of his uh, 1890 publication on the history of Asherism in German, which was published by Brills at that time as it provides a nice connection to my talk, since in the Gautier correspondence, which is held by the Library of the Academy, there are 157 letters from this scholar. And I am especially glad because Sabine is currently also working on Martin Schreiner and her research, and in her research, she also uses the Gautier correspondence, uh, which proves well the use of digital collections in contemporary scholarship and which is also an excellent advertisement for this collection. So my talk will be composed of three parts. In the beginning, I shall present the Academy and its library, followed by an overview of the various Near Eastern and other major holdings of the Oriental collection. While in the third part, I shall elaborate in some detail the results of my preliminary analysis of one of our Arabic manuscripts that is referred to in the title of the talk. No special part of my talk will be dedicated to digital humanities in the library. However, references will be made throughout uh, the talk to digital projects and initiatives. In presenting a general overview of the collection, 
I am greatly indebted to former research on the history of the collection conducted by curators past and present, of course, including myself and all my colleagues, while the findings that I shall share with you concerning the Yemeni manuscript are based on my so only research. Now, uh, where I am actually, uh, and uh, how long it would have taken to me to get into. So this is one of the positive sides of this pandemic, probably, that I can be, give this talk. Um, because otherwise, Hungary is a small landlocked country in the middle of Europe. And it is home to slightly less than 10 million people who arrived at their homeland, the Carpathian Basin, over a thousand and hundred years ago, after having roamed the Eurasian steppes for about a thousand years. Hungarian prehistory has always occupied the thoughts of many Hungarians who dreamt about finding traces of their forefathers in the distant steppes of Eurasia, together with linking their peculiar structured language to others that were considered to yield prestige. Among others, they even tried to link it to Sanskrit for that matter. I mean, so I mean, a wonderful array of various different languages. It can thus be said that for the Hungarians, the Orient represents more than a mere geographical notion. It was the 19th century with national independence and the progress of civil society that brought about the corroboration of national identity. The question of where the origins of the Hungarian people lay and which languages could be deemed as relatives of their tongue became a focus of general interest. It was also a period in which Oriental studies flourished across Europe, encouraging scientific scrutiny in Hungary as well. Hungarian travelers and scholars attracted to the East by the prehistory of their own nation often played a significant role in the geographical, geological, ethnological, zoological, and even botanical documentation of Asia. This period full of vicissitudes was also witness to spectacular accomplishments in Hungarian history. During the first two decades, a reform movement was emerging in Hungary under the oppression of the Habsburg emperors of Austria, which aimed to achieve civil progress as well as national independence. National institutions were established to realize these goals and to foster and promote Hungarian language and culture. One of these institutions was the Hungarian Learned Society, which has later become known as the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Its history began in 1825 when Count István Széchenyi, one of the leading figures of the Hungarian reform movement, offered one year's income of his estate for the purposes of a learned society during the session of the Hungarian Diet on the 3rd of November in that year, which event you can see depicted on the left of the slide. Széchenyi's example was soon followed by other notables. The main tasks specified by him were the cultivation of the Hungarian language and the study and propagation of the sciences and the arts in Hungarian. The academy started to function in 1830 the first General Assembly being held in February 1831. A few months after Széchenyi's symbolic act, on the 17th of March 1826, Count Józef Teleki, uh, who is on the right of this slide, historian and future first president of the Academy, offered his private library of 30,000 books and manuscripts to the Learned Society, thereby founding its library. The collection, growing with the help and donations from various sources, was opened for scholars in 1844 after the necessary organizing and processing work had been completed. In 1865, the library received suitable and up-to-date accommodation in the newly constructed neoclassical palace of the Academy, which has remained its seat ever since. In accordance with the intention of the founder, these favorable conditions made it possible for the library to be opened in 1867 for the use of all the citizens of the country. In the course of the following decades, the collection was developed from several sources like valuable endowments, legal deposits and exchange contacts with foreign learned societies and academies by purchasing foreign books and subscribing to foreign periodicals. The steady development of the library, however, 
came to an end with the First World War. The investment capital of the academy lost its value due to inflation, and the publishing activity was almost completely given up. Thus, the majority of exchange contacts was also interrupted as a result of the diminishing number of publications. Although the necessity of the formation of a separate oriental collection had been stressed by Hungarian scholars already in the 19th century, it was established as a special section within the library only after the restructuring of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences after the Second World War in 1949. This happened thanks to the efforts of the then vice president, the outstanding philologist, who is um, on the, uh, in the slide as well, whose picture is in the slide as well, Louis Ligeti, who specialized uh, in Mongolian and Turkic languages, but also in Chinese for that matter. So that was a time when people were specialized in several, several uh, languages, not only one or two, but very wide ranging languages. First, a scientific committee was formed in order to help the establishment of an oriental collection within the library on the basis of its books, scientific journals, and even manuscripts related to the Orient and Hungarian prehistory. Then, later during the same year, a decision was made to collect surplus material relevant to the aforementioned topics from different Hungarian libraries and academic institutions. In 1950, a section of the Academy's palace had been assigned to the new collection, and its furnishing and supplying with the necessary equipment started. The collection, known at that time as the Oriental Library, was opened in 1951 on the ground floor of the Palace of the Academy to become the main reference library of Oriental studies in Hungary. Until our days, the Oriental collection has been housed in this building at the same, uh, in the same rooms, in fact. Similar to the main library, the establishment and enrichment of the Oriental collection can also be linked to different donations and bequests. Its development, including the design of its reading room, which is not very practical for reading purposes, but uh, I think you will recognize the features of the tulip period uh, of Tur uh, in Turkish architecture, is uh, thanks to the Turkologist Laszlo Rasyonyi, who headed the collection, uh, from 1951 to 1961. He selected its East related stock from the old divisions of the library. In addition to contemporary monographs, the collection became enriched by 16th to, to 18th century books written about the Orient or in Oriental languages. The holdings also include the most comprehensive Hungarian collection of periodicals of Oriental studies together with unique manuscripts. It can be established that even internationally recognized manuscript collections were donated to the library and not purchased. Even in a brief overview of the Oriental collection, the following main units of special interest should be identified and mentioned in some detail. So in the forthcoming part of my uh, presentation, uh, I will talk about these uh, six uh, uh, major units or sub collections. Before dealing in some detail with collections pertaining to the Near East, uh, be it Arabic, Persian, Turkish, or Hebrew, I'd like to draw your attention to two particularly important collections. One of these is the Toma de Kuros archive of the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Alexander Toma de Kuros, uh, the, whose name is written in Tibetan uh, under his portrait, is a Hungarian scholar who went to the East to find the original homeland and possible traces of the Magyar tribes. And he has incidentally become the first person to interpret the cultural heritage of the Tibetan people to Europe. He compiled the first Tibetan English dictionary of scientific value together with the grammar of the Tibetan language which were both published in 1834 in Calcutta by the Baptist Mission Press. In addition, with his scholarly work, he became the founder of Tibetan studies, a new discipline at that time of Oriental studies in Europe. He died in Darjeeling in 1842 en route to the Uyghurs, whom he believed to be the relatives of the Hungarians. The library 
conserves his unique documentary heritage, including the so-called Alexander books, compiled by the Tibetan lamas at Thomas' explicit request, and containing outlines of various fields of Tibetan literature and scholarship. This prestigious documentary heritage, which was submitted by Hungary and accepted for inclusion in the memory of the World Register in 2009, and from which you could see a specimen on this slide, was donated to the library, or you can still see this specimen, was donated to the library by Thomas' first enthusiastic biographer. I'd just like to call your attention here that this is one of the instances where digital humanities uh, uh, plays a role because in the link you can see uh, on, in this slide, the whole uh, Alex, so-called Alexander book together with its English translation and Tibetan translation made by one of my colleagues at the uh, Oriental Collection, Gerger Oros, Oros um, are available freely online uh, at the homepage at that homepage, which is mentioned in the slide. So uh, this collection was donated to the library by Thomas Firth enthusiastic biographer, Theodore Duca, who having fought in the 1848 War of Independence, had to flee the country after the surrender in 1849, and later served in the medical corps of the British Bengalese army. As a correspondent member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, he never forgot to enrich his library as much as he could. His major contribution being a small library that he, did, he donated in 1885 and having acquired it from Solomon C. Malin, whom you can also see in this slide, the secretary of the Asiatic Society of Bangor, to whom Thomas taught the Tibetan language. Now let's turn our attention to the Central Asia collection of Sir Oral Stein. A towering figure of Central Asian archaeology was the Hungarian-born Sir, Sir Oral Stein, who was greatly inspired by Choma's Eastern journey and who considered him as his predecessor. He partly donated and partly willed his library to the academy, which in addition to his books and periodicals also contained over 8,000 photographs of his expeditions together with about 1,500 letters addressed to him, some of his manuscripts and maps. The library, I mean our library, that is the library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, has always been keen on making its holdings available for multiple audiences. Accordingly, the Oriental Collection is one of the partners having provided data to the International Tunhuang Project entitled The Silk Road Online, where the historical photographs made by Stein are freely available. As you can see it on this, in this slide. As metadata, they are accompanied by relevant information from the printed catalogue together with the bibliography of eventual publications. Well, to continue uh, after this brief uh, overview of non-Near uh, Eastern material in our library, I'd like to offer a brief overview of the collections that are more relevant to Near Eastern studies. Within this framework, I should like to start by presenting two collections of Turkish manuscripts and rare books named after their original owners, Daniel Siladi and Arminius Vambiri. Similar to Thomas' first biographer, Theodor Duca, another person who fought in the 1848 War of Independence, a former theologian, also started a new life after, war, after the war. This person was Daniel Siladi, who emigrated to Istanbul and lived there until his death. After the Crimean War, he purchased in Istanbul the bookshop in which he previously worked as an apprentice. And from that time on, the shop became an important store of rare oriental prints and manuscripts, not only for the Turkish reform intellectuals, but also for visiting Hungarian scholars. It was there he made the acquaintance of Arminius Vambiri, the noted Turkologist and traveler. After the death of Siladi in 1885, it was Vambiri who managed to convince the Academy that they should purchase the collection for the low and advantageous price. And uh, in the beginning of my talk, I have emphasized that the 
Academy has always preferred not to purchase, but to accept donations. So it was a difficult task for Ranbiri to, to be able to manage, uh, to convince the Academy that they should really purchase it because it's such of, it is of such high value uh, and the price was so low. Uh, and uh, although the legacy was composed at that time of three main groups, 90,000 books in uh, 90, 9,000 books in European languages on Oriental subjects, 500 Oriental primary Turkish manuscripts, and uh, 2,000 Turkish printed books. Uh, at that time, the academic could only afford to purchase the manuscripts. Ironically, however, the books uh, later also found their way to the Oriental collection after the Second World War, as I have explained that uh, in the uh, beginning that uh, they went around, so to say, and collected material that was relevant to the Orient uh, that was brought into the collection. A large part of the manuscripts uh, from this collection is devoted to the history of the Ottoman Empire, especially the period of Ottoman rule in Hungary. Of course, this this not this particular manuscript you are seeing, but I I just uh, selected some which are beautiful <laughs> and not uh, nice because not important because of their content. Uh, so excellent chronicles can be found here while a number of literary sources give valuable descriptions of the history of Turkish rule in Hungary. More than 200 manuscripts contain literary works, uh, uh, including 10 different versions of the story of the Sassanid Emperor Khosrow and the Armenian Princess Shirin. Vanbiri himself also enriched the library of the Academy, of which he was one of the prominent members. Although containing altogether only 60 manuscripts, so much, much smaller in size than the aforementioned Silaidi collection, it contains several valuable, sometimes unique items, which are often relevant from the point of view of Hungarian history. By the way, in the slide, you can see two very different images of Van Beri. One is the traveler of the East in disguise in, dervish, in the cloak of a dervish, and the other is the scholar of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Um, so uh, getting back to uh, his collection, uh, it is a mention can be made of the 16th century uh, history of Hungary, uh, from which uh, the opening page is, uh, the title page is uh, uh, seen here, or an exceptional copy of the well known fable collection, uh, Faraj Vade Shidda, uh, Joy After Sorrow, copied in Edirne in 1451, being the oldest copy among the manuscripts of this work known today thus providing a key written evidence of Ottoman Turkish language from that period. I'd like to mention uh, in connection with this manuscript that this is not Tanukhi's uh, Arabic version translated to the Turkish, although that uh, is also available uh, in a, a few manuscripts in our library, but this is a different collection uh, with the same title. Other manuscripts from his collection bear witness to Eastern Turkish languages, in addition to a few but valuable volumes in Arabic and Persian. Vanberi also regularly sent a copy of his publications to the library of the Academy, while the remaining part of his bequest was donated to the Academy by his son. From among the rare books of the Vanberi collection, mention must be made of a few copies that form part of the library's collection of the three series of Ottoman Turkish incunabula that were published by Ibrahim Mutaferikas Press in Istanbul between 1728 and 1742, and by his successors around 1756 and finally in 1783. It might be interesting to note in this regard that Ibrahim Mutaferika was a Hungarian convert born in Transylvania who rose to great eminence and managed to play an important role in Turkish cultural history. This slide shows one of his own writings, which was also published by the press. Now let's continue uh, with the David Kaufman collection of Hebrew ma manuscripts, Geniza fragments and rare books. 
which however may not need a long introduction because despite the relative smallness of its size, its importance is well known all over the world. David Kaufmann was born in Moravia in 1852 and became one of the first three professors at the newly founded rabbinical seminary in Budapest in 1877. The only condition of his employment was that he should learn Hungarian, to which he complied with formidable speed, uh, despite the difficulties, because Hungarian language is considered uh, even more difficult than Arabic. So I think it was a great accomplishment for him. In 1881, he married Irma Gompers, the exquisitely educated daughter of a considerably affluent family. His new financial situation, coupled with his erudition in Jewish literature and his passion to collect, enabled him to collect more than a thousand rare printed books, over 600 Hebrew manuscripts and about 700 Geniza fragments. After the premature death of Kaufmann in 1899, and his wives in 1905, the whole collection was donated by Kaufmann's mother-in-law in accordance with the intentions of the deceased to the library of the Hungarian Academy. Kaufmann, however, was not only an avid collector, but also an accomplished scholar. His research and achievements in the field of the history of Jewish art and especially in the history of manuscript illustration are of epoch-making significance. Traditional public opinion was, for example, that Jews always abhorred figural representation in any form because their religion forbade it. Kaufman was perhaps the first scholar of stature to draw attention to, this, to the erroneousness of this view, proving it untenable by marshalling a large and comprehensive corpus. Thus, it is understandable that he is also regarded as the founder of the scholarly discipline of Jewish art history. His collection, uh, of books and manuscripts is significant because it is rich in unique and rare items, and so considering its quality, it is reckoned among the foremost collections of its kind in the world. The manuscript collection, whose first catalog, the manuscript and book collection, and Ganyu and Ganyu's a fragment, etc., etc. So the whole collection. Uh, the first catalog was compiled by Max Weiss in 1906. Uh, and it contains biblical texts with commentaries, linguistic and Masoretic texts, uh, different uh, works on Talmudic methodology, Kabbalistic writings, theology, philosophy, uh, homiletics, poetry, prayer books, etc., etc., including works on math mathematics and medicine as well. The collection is particularly rich in response of Italian rabbis. These are important not only from the point of view of religious law, but are also first-class historical sources on everyday life, customs, and habits. A considerable part of the manuscripts come from, comes from Italy. In this context, it may be mentioned that in 1895, Kaufmann succeeded in acquiring the complete collection of manuscripts and books of the eminent Mantua Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Marco Mortara. The most important manuscript in the collection uh, is no doubt the Mishnah manuscript, which is sometimes simply referred to as the Codex Kaufmann. Uh, there are four complete manuscripts extant of the Mishnah, three manuscripts of the Palestinian and one of the Babylonian text version, and the Kaufmann Mishnah is regarded as the best of the manuscripts following the Palestinian version. It does not have a colophon, so views differ as to its age and origin. It is generally believed to have been copied in Italy and is dated to have been written sometime between the 10th and 12th centuries. Kaufmann acquired the manuscript uh, three years uh, before his death after all sorts of difficulties and he gave expression to his great joy in his own Psalm of David, which he wrote in his well-known violet ink, which you can see it in a small size in this slide. On the flyleaf, in in the front part of the manuscript. Since its foundation, the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, working in line with its mission statement, has dedicated itself to supporting scientific and scholarly research and safeguarding its precious collections for generations to come. Well, um, in connection with safeguarding, I'd like to 
albeit reluctantly, call your attention to this library stamp, I mean, which not particularly shows safeguarding, but it's of course 19th century or early 20th century, when curators were just keen on stamping everything uh, without restriction. We wouldn't do it, of course, today. So uh, sometimes, however, the collection provides opportunities for very specific research, as was done in the case of the manuscript of the Mishnah, where the aim was to combine material sciences with traditional philology to enhance our understanding of the creation and the history of the manuscript. The Kaufman Codex is particularly famous for its vocalization that was prepared following the consonantal text of a different manuscript as the countless differences demonstrate. But where and when was the vocalization made? Paleography can only date and localize consonants, not Tiberian vowels. It is agreed that the vocalizer was not one of the two main scribes of the consonantal text. Can we correlate the vowels to one of the numerous scribes that wrote marginal annotations and corrections and then use paleography to provenance it? As we have hundreds of marginal annotations in dozens of different scripts, optical comparison of the ink color alone is not sufficient. To establish the different ink types used, an X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy ink analysis was conducted to give a much more precise estimation of the elemental composition of the different ink types used. One important result of this very preliminary analysis of which uh, there are no final results as yet, was that no carbon ink was used in any of the layers of this manuscript. The analysis was carried out by Ira Rabin and Oliver Hahn, member of, members of the Bundesanstalt für Materialforschung und Prüfung in Berlin, and the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures in Hamburg, in conjunction with paleographer Daniel Stöckel ben Ezra from the Ecole Predictis Autitude in Paris. From the special group of 25 richly illuminated Hebrew parchment manuscripts, which were donated to the library from the co private collection of Kaufmann's mother in law, Mrs. Rosa Gompert, and many of which had earlier belonged to the Trieste brothers in Padova. One should first of all mention the infolio manuscript of Maimonides' Mishneh Torah in four volumes, which is a work on religious law, but is nevertheless considered as one of the absolute masterpieces of medieval Hebrew art, the reason of which you can see if you look at these slides. It was written in northeastern France and was completed in 1296. Another outstanding manuscript of the Kaufmann collection is the so-called Kaufmann Haggadah, which was produced in 14th century Catalonia. In addition to the lavish illustrations, it contains the prayers, poems, and narrative texts to be recited on the eve of the festival of the Jewish Easter, the feast of Passover, in which the participants recall the joy of deliverance from servitude in Egypt, thanking God for his miraculous work. The presentation of the manuscripts from this collection could easily fill several talks, so I would just conclude this part with another fascinating manuscript, which is the first part, first volume of the High Holiday Prayer Book, the so-called Tripartite Mahzor. This manuscript was written in southern Germany, in the region of Lake Constance, around 1320. Dating was held by an illustration depicting the depicting the Battle of Mühldorf that happened in 1322. The two remaining volumes of this manuscript are preserved in the British Library and in the Bodleian in Oxford. An interesting characteristic of the manuscript is that human female figures generally appear with animals' heads. Although the adoption of animal heads occurs in illuminated manuscripts produced in France and Germany in the 13th and 14th centuries, but the general habit is to represent all human figures in this way, in contradicting dis distinction to our manuscript. And uh, I currently know, don't know of any universally accepted explanation for this peculiarity. Somebody might in the audience, who knows? Let's hope so. Um, 
The library takes uh, every opportunity to engage in, uh, no, I thought it was freezing, but no. The library takes every opportunity to engage in state-of-the-art examination of these important manuscripts, engaging in various initiatives of digitization, like, for example, the Ketiv project of digitized Hebrew manuscripts of the National Library of Israel, or the Friedberg Geniza project, which virtually unites the scattered fragments of the Cairo Geniza. It should also be mentioned that parallel to the recent online cataloging of of these manuscripts after more than a hundred years they were donated to the library. Their digital copies were also made available in the digital repository of the Library of the Academy, the link of which appears also in the slide. Now let's continue our overview of the collection uh, with the Alexander von Kegel Library of Persian Manuscripts and Rare Books. A similarly erudite scholar, I mean similarly to Kaufman, uh, and passionate collector, albeit of a very different background, was Alexander von Kegel, the student of Van Beri and Goldsier, the polymath of Oriental Studies, and the first professor of Persian literature at the University of Budapest. He hailed from a landowner family with a great passion for collecting books. His library of over 11,000 volumes was donated after his death to the Library of the Academy, of which he was a corresponding member. His remarkable collection of Persian manuscripts contain 59 titles, well reflecting his interest, especially in Indo-Persian literature. Some of these, like the Bhagavad Gita, as well as their authors, like Emil Khosro, for example, were also subjects of his studies and lectures. An interesting feature of the manuscript of the Bhagavad Gita, for example, is that it also contains the Arabic transcription of the original Sanskrit text alongside with the Persian translation. The works considered by Kegel as important exist in more than one copy in the library, including, for example, Jami's works or Saadi's works. Besides the divans of renowned Persian poets, the collection also includes the gems of mystical literature, as well as some works on history, lexicography, and grammar. The oldest Persian manuscript of the Oriental collection, the Kalila Wadimna, uh, copied in 1319, is also from the Kegel Library, but unfortunately that is not illuminated. To facilitate access and raise awareness, the Oriental Collection participated in the Cambridge Shahnameh project with four illustrated Shahnameh manuscripts uh, from the Kegel Collection primarily, as a result of which uh, 57 illustrations and their descriptions have become freely accessible worldwide. The beginnings of this project, as I was informed by Firuza Melville, Director of Research at the Sahnama Center for Persian Studies, Pembroke College, Cambridge, go back to the time she spent at uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies, while the godfather of the project was Oleg Grabar. Unfortunately, this project has been experiencing a serious problem in the last several months more or less since the server was moved to the one which is hosted and shared with the Cambridge University Library. This incident shows well the fragility of our digital world, and this is why I cannot show you the actual homepage of this uh, uh, project, um, although it was available, let's say, one month ago. Let's move on to the correspondence of the manu and manuscripts of Ignaz Goldsehe. Nearly 100 years after the death of Ignaz Goldsier, scholars still turned to his scholarly legacy for inspiration in their studies on various aspects of Islam. Recently, the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences has completed the cataloging and digitization of the over 13,000 letters addressed to Ignaz Goldsier and kept in the Oriental collection of the library in the arrangement of his son. The correspondence, together with other literary remains of the great, great scholar, was donated to the Academy in 1926 by his son, Karoy. But already before that year, 
His library was acquired by the newly founded Hebrew University of Jerusalem, becoming the nucleus of what is today the Islam and Middle Eastern collection of the National Library of Israel. And this again points to the fact that the academy was never able to buy anything to, to give money for whatever precious the collection might have been, they preferred donations, but this was not uh, to be donated, it was sold to uh, the Hebrew University. Gautier considered that answering letters and taking part in international congresses are just as important as literary work. Uh, that is to say, writing articles and publishing books. Uh, and Sabina is smiling because she just communicated to me that she has been working on the Friedrich Kern letters uh, in the Goldseher collection. So I just checked and uh, I know now that we have uh, 59 letters. Uh, so there is still some uh, something to work on <laughs> in future uh, projects. But Kern was, uh, Kern was not uh, among the great letter writers uh, whom you can see uh, listed here, uh, who wrote more than uh, uh, 100 letters to Gautier. And of course, it's always interesting to see uh, whether the, the other end of the correspondence is available in another uh, collection somewhere in the world. So throughout his life, Gautier kept himself to this principle, meticulously answering letters addressed to him in various languages. And that's uh, uh, also one of the impossible tasks uh, uh, standing in front of uh, modern day researchers that uh, Gautier uh, answered letters in German, French, English, Arabic, Hebrew, Hungarian, or anything else. Uh, the Gautier Room of the Academy was opened on the 18th of October 1933, seven years after the donation of the documents containing, in addition to the correspondence, his handwritten notes, preliminary studies to his publications, and the manuscripts of some unpublished and published works. It was thanks to the painstaking efforts of two scholars joined by Gautier's son that the correspondence was arranged into 47 boxes and an alphabetical list of all the letter writers was compiled, also indicating the number of letters sent to Gautier. We cannot be grateful enough for this heroic work without which our coherent and meaningful transformation of this correspondence to the digital platform, which was carried out uh, in 2013 and 2014, would have been Im an impossible task considering the amount of the letters. The project which I have mentioned, and which was not only a digitization, um, uh, the letters, it was not only a digitization because the letters were also cataloged and made available both in the online catalog of the library and its digital repository. It is probably needless to say that in addition to the above mentioned pieces, the Oriental collection of the library of the academy holds other smaller, uh, this is the, how it looks like everywhere in the repository, in the catalog. And uh, uh, I would like to call your attention to this letter because Gautier died uh, two years uh, uh, before this letter was addressed to him because it's dated uh, 1923. Um, so uh, there are other co smaller connect collections in which several yet unexplored hidden gems are waiting to be rediscovered. One such collection is the bequest of the noted Turkologist Ignaz Kunosh, a larger part of which remains unedited. Kunosh, uh, who you can see uh, on, on the right uh, of this slide, uh, Kunosh collected a large amount of folklore material between 1915 and 17 among prisoners of war in the town of Eger, now in the Czech Republic. This collection contains folk song tales, diaries, playlets, etc., in different dialects like Crimean, Tatar, Bashkir, Kumyuk, Nogai, etc. To this, we may add the later collection by Kunosh he made amongst Tatars who lived at that time in Istanbul. Another such collection is that of uh, Arabic manuscripts, which although tiny in comparison with some really major manuscript collections, represents the largest one in Hungary. 
It contains 306 works in 179 manuscripts. Parallel to the publication of its online and printed catalog, the library has joined the digitization program launched by Brill in the course of which extra care was taken to provide high quality digital images, which allowed the study of not only the text, but also the visual features of the manuscripts, as you could see it in the previous slide where one could really feel the radiation of the golden layers. The background of the collection is also quite varied. No great collector can be singled out, although a significant part can be traced back to the small community of Muslims who lived in Hungary in the beginning of the 20th century, while another part was acquired in Istanbul by a Hungarian theologian uh, who had been sent uh, to Istanbul in 1914 to search for archival documents relevant to the history of Hungary. The small group of Muslims who lived in Hungary in the beginning of the 20th century did not, however, form a homogeneous community. Uh, they were divided among themselves into Turks and Bosniaks mainly, but the center of their worship for both communities were the shrine of Gulbaba, the 16th century Bektashi dervish, uh, which after having been converted to a Jesuit chapel in the 18th century, regained its position in Islam as the northernmost center of Sufi pilgrimage after the dissolution of the Jesuit order at the end of the 18th century. And uh, this has been reconfirmed uh, by today's uh, visits by Muslims uh, in, um, from various countries. Now I turn uh, to the title of my presentation, and I do hope that I have sufficient time to uh, deal with that as well. So manuscripts from the rich literary heritage of Yemen can sometimes be found in libraries outside Yemen. From among these, a relatively unknown collection is held by the Oriental Collection in Budapest, where Yemeni manuscripts are available both in Arabic and Hebrew. In the Kaufman collection, 35 manuscripts are considered to have Yemeni origin distinguished by their style of writing. These include manuscripts of different parts of the Bible, liturgical poems, and prayer books. In addition to 15 Geniza fragments, which can also be confirmed as having a Yemeni background. From among the Arabic manuscripts, four non-dated titles are relevant to Arabia, but only one directly to Yemen. This work is entitled, uh, as you can see uh, in the slide, on when al-sharaf al-wafi bi ilm al-fiqh wal-arud wa tarikh wa nakh wa al-qawafi. This encyclopedic work of Ibn al-Muqri, uh, an accomplished author of Rasul in Yemen, will be presented in the forthcoming part of my talk. I should also like to call your attention that a more detailed paper on this manuscript will be published in a volume uh, edited as chief editor by Andre Gour on the manuscript heritage of Yemen. After this preliminary analysis of the manuscript, this is also among my intentions to devote a more in-depth study to its contents and more particularly to the parts dealing with grammar, prosody and rhyme, where I feel myself more comfortable. Uh, I, but I do hope that probably this uh, talk will arouse the interest of some scholars who would be interested to uh, deal with um, other parts of this manuscript like jurisprudence and the Rasulid history. Uh, may I ask how much time is left? Um, well, take your time. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's, I'm coming to the end, but slowly. <laughs> slowly. Before the Rasulid era, the Zaidi Imamat controlled only some parts of northern Yemen, while most of the country was held by non-Zaidi dynasties. This fragmentation of the Thaos changed with the reign of the second Rasulid Sultan, Al Muzaffar Yusuf, who not only consolidated the dynasty's rule, but also achieved an unprecedented unity under his long reign, irrespective of the fact that the Zaidi and Ismaili tribes of the north enjoyed great autonomy. This unity, coupled with the solid economic foundations of the Rasulid rule, based on trade and agriculture, together with the dynasty's passion for culture, provided a solid background for the flourishing of civilization during the whole era, 
and especially in the 13th and 14th centuries, which are generally considered the pinnacle of Rasulite political power and cultural grandeur. Before the Rasulites, who were staunch Shafis, it was the Ayyubid dynasty that had ruled the southern part of Yemen from 1173, and they were the ones who contributed greatly to the spread of Sunni Islam in the region. Although the origin of the Rasul is, is obscure, and according to some sources, they descend from a clan of August Turks, they however succeeded in claiming descent from the local Ghassanids and ultimately from Kahtan, the progenitor of the South Arabs. This genealogy made them the first dynasty of uh, such say local origin, which without doubt contributed greatly to their acceptance and stability and the stability of their rule over an extended period in the history of Yemen. The author, whose full name you can see uh, in this line, was born in 1354 in the tri tribe of Shawar in the Yemeni locality of Abiyat Hussein in the region of Sharjah, uh, which is on the shores of the Red Sea. He is generally known as Ibn al-Mukri or al-Mukri al-Zabidi, Having received his initial education from the elders of his tribe, uh, in 1380, he departed to Zabid, one of the cultural capitals of the epoch, to continue his studies in jurisprudence, grammar, and several other fields of learning. He excelled in all his chosen subjects, uh, and his fame surpassed that of his peers, so much so that he has soon become an authority on jurisprudence, grammar, and logic, in addition to being an accomplished writer, both in prose and poetry, and a professor in the Mujahideya Madrasa in Taiz and the Nizamiya Madrasa in Zabid, by appointment of the Sultan Al Ashraf Ismail. His knowledge and intelligence far surprised the confines of Rasul in Yemen and made him worthy of praise by biographers and historians, with Shaukani asserting that no person similar to him has ever been born in the Yemen who could surpass his intelligence, sharp understanding, and correct thinking. Ibn al-Mukri uh, placed his bright mind at the disposal of the Rasulid court, whose sultans appointed him into various positions, from teaching in Taiz and Zabid, to being an ambassador of Yemen in Cairo. He enjoyed the favor of the Rasulid sultans and earned an excellent pay throughout his life. However, the position he had been hoping for that of the chief Qadi of Yemen was denied for, from him even after the death of Asfiru Zabadi, the holder of this office. This can most probably att be attributed to his legendary obliviousness, as was noted by his near contemporary, the Hadith scholar and historian As Sakhavi. He died in Zabid in 1433, leaving behind a fair number of treatises in addition to this work his most peculiar one. His main field of composition was Shafi's jurisprudence, where in addition to the main part of the present collection, he authored four works. He also composed the history of the Yemen and was an accomplished poet, uh, his poetry being loaded with difficult words and rhetoric figures. The encyclopedic work which is presented here contains treatises on Shafi jurisprudence, Arabic grammar, Rasul history, prosody, and rhyme. The 15th century was, in general, a period of encyclopedias in the world of Islam, and the choice of the topics can easily be explained as including four that would be most useful as texts to be memorized in the Madrasa curriculum, in addition to the flattering history of the Rasuli dynasty from the time of its foundation until the composition of this work, by which, as well as to the sophisticated arrangement of the work, the open author could hope to elevate his position. Our current analysis of this composition does not primarily focus on its contents, but rather on its being a tour de force concerning its form. According to as sakhavi the composition of this work is allegedly linked to the fact mentioned above that Ibn al-Mukri was aspiring for the position of chief judge and was inspired by a work of Al-Firu Zabadi all the lines of which started with the letter Alif, and by which he gained the favor of the Sultan. Ibn al-Mukri's five compositions contained in this volume are relatively 
short texts suitable to be taught as basic texts in the madrasa curriculum that should be amplified in the course of teaching by way of commentaries, glosses, and super glosses. Hence, his aim seems not to excel in the originality of the contents of his treatises, but to create a highly original form difficult to achieve, so as to yield the esteem of the Sultan and the admiration of his peers. The main work on Shafi's jurisprudence follows the general contents and arrangements of such works from the part on ritual purity until the final part on judgeship. The other four treatises are short compendia in the usual style of the given genres and with their well-established contents. The originality of the form, however, might have prevented the book from becoming a popular collection of short texts that can be effectively used in teaching. One cannot but sympathize with the talented author who, for all his efforts and originality, could not achieve his aim of gaining, on account of this composition, the position he aspired for. In his undertaking, Ibn al mukri did not adhere to any previous models. On the contrary, he followed his own ingenious device in planning the texts. The layout of the pages is very peculiar since the main text on jurisprudence, which runs horizontally, is so contrived that the four other treatises can be read out of it vertically. The text thus forms seven columns from which every odd column written in red ink contains a different treatise. The title lists the works on the basis of their importance and prestige, starting with jurisprudence and grammar. The author's main professional interests, combined with the general high status of jurisprudence and its textual importance in this particular work, is emphasized by the fact that this text occupies the central place, being the only one written horizontally. The order of the works written in the columns does not follow the title. Column one deals with prosody, column three with history, column five with grammar, and column seven with rhyme. To help the reader, the words which also form part of an additional treatise are written in red ink. The words of the first and last treatises, prosody and rhyme, are generally made up of the first and last letters of each line. Although sometimes longer sequences, more letters or complete words are also used. To ease the comprehension, these letters are not only repeated outside the red border in the present manuscript, but also at the top right and left corners in the form of words instead of individual characters. In addition to the text of the additional treatises, red ink is used to indicate the chapter headings of the main work on jurisprudence, as you can observe it in this slide. Ibn al mukri started to work on this composition during the reign of the ruler al afsh of Ismail, whose name is mentioned in the beginning of the part on prosody, alleging that this was ordered by him. As you can see in this slide that the text which is repeated in uh, three uh, lines above uh, the text uh, has originally been written as three uh, vertical columns and uh, co the column to the utmost right is Amarabit uh, Alif Hada Kitab wa Jamihi, and the column in the middle is Maulana Sultan al Malik al Ashraf, and the third column to the left is Ismail ibn al Abbas, Adama, etc. etc. So you should read vertically and connect the letters, and this will give you the same uh, text. And this text is repeated uh, uh, always uh, at, in the, at the top right corner of the pages. This Sultan, however, could not honor Ibn al mukri for his elaborate work because he had died before it was finished. This happened, this uh, honor, during the reign of the next ruler, which is noted at the end of the treatise in history, saying that this history and by this, the whole book was completed on the second day of the month of Muharram in the year 804, that is to say on the 12th of August, 1401, in the town of Taiz, the capital of the Rasulids. The part on Arabic grammar is a shorter text, so it was finished a few days earlier. Um, 
and to fill the remaining pages in this column as well, Ibn al-Mukri appended to the text of a grammar, a short autobiographical note, emphasizing the magnanimity of the two Rasul sultans in his regard. The manuscript of this work in the Oriental Collection uh, of the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences is a nicely written, complete 17th century copy of the original composition. The text lacks a colophon, hence nothing refers to the copies or the date and place where the copy was made. No collation notes are given either, although there is some evidence of the use of an earlier copy. It is written on thick glazed lead paper. Um, and is made up of 76 uh, originally unnumbered folios to which a 20th century library foliation was added by pencil. The main body of the text is included in a red rule border and the columns are also divided by red vertical lines. The borders and dividing lines do not serve as a decoration, but their function is to signal the boundaries of the different treatises, although the lines are straight they do not run parallel to each other, so the width of the columns varies between the top and the bottom of the page. Nevertheless, the text sometimes has to be crammed to fit within a column, which points to the fact that the borders and columns had been made before the copying of the text. The script is a fully pointed nasr in one hand, one scribal hand. It is unvocalized, but the sign of shadda is used. The ink is black, additional treatises and headings of the main treatise and jurisprudence are in red. Marginal corrections appear in both black and red. Since the manuscript is not dating, the examination of the paper used is especially important. The distance of chain lines and the types of watermarks can help us in dating the manuscript. The watermarks are placed, as you can probably see in this slide, in the middle of a bifolio so that they are cut in half by being folded. Hence, they are only discernible with some difficulty. Under these circumstances, the use of digital technology comes as a very handy tool, which can be used to identify the watermarks and the countermarks. With the help of images captured through a light sheet, three watermarks and one countermark could be discerned. One of the watermarks is a lamb, Agnus Dei, in a cartridge formed by four arcs of a circle that is a quatrefoil. This is the most frequently appearing watermark in this manuscript, which can be observed 10 times. The use of such watermarks was typical of 17th century Venetian paper, but it was also used often surmounted by a star, a crown, a cross, and sometimes letters in other parts of Italy uh, over an extended period. It was so well spread that it was often used in conjunction with the second watermark and with various countermarks. The second watermark is a counterfoil, which occurs three times in the manuscript. The length of the clover's pedicle accounts for the difference of the otherwise quasi-symmetrical image. Its center line, similarly to all the other uh, watermarks, is chain line four. The third watermark is a seven-point crown with a six-point star and a crescent. And it also appears three times in the manuscript. While the lamb refers to a Christian symbol, the crown star crescent watermark and other combinations of these elements are thought to have been developed in Europe for papers to be exported to the Islamic lands. The use of this watermark reaffirms the dating of the manuscript to the 17th century, at the same time providing a closer definition to the second half of the century on the basis of manuscripts identified in other collections where the examples run from between uh, 1658 until 1677. Now about the countermark, only one countermark appears in the manuscript on folio 31. It consists of two letters under a trefoil. The letter to the right is a B, as you can see. Uh, the other seems to be an I, although it is somewhat difficult to see because of the writing. It, cannot be, it also cannot be ascertained whether the letters are joined by a bar or not. It belongs to the series, this countermark belongs to the series of well-known Venetian countermarks consisting of two or three letters joined in this way. Since the trefoil was replaced by lily in 1757, 
this provides a terminus antequem for our, our manuscript. Uh, probably I'll skip the marginal notes and corrections section uh, and uh, continue with the next slide. A particularity of the manuscript is the emphasis it places on the chronology of the rulers in the course of Yemeni history as presented in the work. Since the slide mentions the name of the rulers in red ink in the margin as a kind of chapter heading. I don't want to talk about the binding in detail. This is a marble paper Ebru covers. Uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, and it uh, emphasizes the importance of documentation, that uh, it was a, a binding with an envelope flap. With the flap is now missing, but um, there were um, microfilm copies made of this manuscript uh, several decades ago. And this uh, is preserved in uh, the microfilm copy. So we know how it looked like when it entered the collection uh, or slightly later than that, of course. Uh, provenance, although no ownership marks or notes prior to the vignettes and stamps of the academy can be found in the manuscript on the basis of the allocated call number, it seems reasonable to suppose uh, that this manuscript had once belonged to the so-called Silagi collection, about which I have been talking a little while ago. Since Albeit being a predominantly Turkish collection, it also contained 25 manuscripts in Arabic. This brings me back to the beginning of my talk when mention was made of the early history of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and its library. During those times, outstanding scholars and members of the academy whom I have cited among the benefactors as well, like, for example, Ignaz Goltier, Alexander von Kegel, and Arminus Vanberi, helped on a voluntary basis to compile lists of donations and build a catalog. Considering their various other obligations and the voluntary nature of their undertaking, we really cannot blame them for not leaving behind more precise descriptions of each and every item. This situation, however, constantly reminds us of the importance of documentation, archiving, and the recording of data in whatever format technology allows us. In the past hour, I have tried to demonstrate the various digital initiatives in which the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Scientists takes part, together with their use in dealing with manuscripts. When I am thanking for your kind attention with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet from the manuscript of the tripartite Mahzor, I intend it to be uh, a signal for a start, since I do not only wish to express my hope that my lecture has demonstrated the existence of several hidden yet unexplored gems in this library, but also that you may eventually explore these digital resources and will discover some useful sources for your own research or you, you just browse it for your own pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's the end of my talk. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kinga. I had to find my unmute button. <laughs> so thank you very much for this rich and exciting presentation. And for the uh, attendees, please use either the chat function or the Q&A. And we will address, I mean, we have quite a crowd today in the, in the uh, audience, and we will try to address as many questions as we can. So let me perhaps with the, start with the first question. Um, and I, I, I read it out, and exp uh, there's an explanation to it. Thanks for the fascinating description of the circumstances of the arrival of the Kaufman manuscripts to the library in Budapest. There's not a week that I do not pursue the excellent scanned copy found on the library's website. I'm very interested to know if there are more early Hebrew manuscripts in the library which have not been published about or cataloged, and is it possible to hope, more, uh, hope for more treasures uh, in this area? And as an explanation, um, the attendee means manuscripts in the library, but have not been mentioned. Any of the catalogs that are new uh, have not been identified or recognized by the catalogers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would also be happy to hear if there are any plans for digital accessibility of additional rabbinical materials. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I think. Um, 
I can uh, explain the situation quite clearly. Uh, the Kaufman collection is the only uh, sizable Hebrew collection uh, which the library holds. Uh, in addition to uh, the so-called uh, uh, bequests from rabbis, Hungarian rabbis, unfortunately, uh, but those are not uh, manuscript volumes, but um, handwritten uh, documents from Hungarian rabbis. Uh, we try to uh, apply for funding, <laughs> not very successfully. Uh, it would really, uh, they are uncatalogued. Uh, they amount approximately to several, I mean, 40 meters. I mean, yeah, quite large. Uh, and uh, we would have liked uh, that to see them cataloged in earnest, uh, but the funding would have been available just for an archival type of cataloging in which we are not interested because we are not an archive, we are a library. But uh, bound, I mean, volumes, manuscript volumes, uh, uh, they stopped with the Kaufman collection and they have all been cataloged uh, in addition to the uh, catalog by Weiss. Uh, there is now um, uh, an online catalog of all the manuscripts uh, and we are near the completion of cataloging the, uh, the printed uh, books of, um, of the Kaufman collection as well in our online catalog. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question we got, are there Christian Arabic manuscripts at your library and how many are they approximately? Yeah, very few, very few uh, Christian manuscripts we have in the library, but we do have some. I would say uh, that their number does not exceed uh, three or four probably. Uh, I have the catalog here. Um, um, but uh, I, I can't give you the, I mean, if I get this question in a chat and I can, uh, I'd be happy to uh, correspond with whoever asked it and uh, give more precise details uh, about this manuscript. Okay, thank you. But they would be listed in the in the catalog that is. They part, are listed. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. They are listed in the catalog, but uh, right. their number. I mean, as I've explained, the the number of Arabic manuscripts is really a, it is a tiny collection. I mean, we are talking about about three hundred works, slightly more than three hundred works in hundred and seventy nine uh, manuscripts. Uh, everything is listed in the catalog. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And also, sorry to interrupt, but the, they are not only listed in the printed catalog, but they are also listed in the online catalog as well. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we got is, um, I wonder if you please can please elaborate on Daniel Silagi, particularly about his bookstore in Istanbul. And the same questioner adds a question. I also have a specific question about MS Toruk 59, the inventory of Palace Library of Mehmed II in the Sun by Yazid. Um, I mean, the famous one that was just published, I assume. <laughs> yes. Have there yeah. been any uh, uh, Yeah, what is the question? Uh, uh, sorry, there the, the came another question. <laughs> Um, well, anyhow, I mean, uh, the, the, so, manuscript... so the the question was, uh, do you have any information when this specific manuscript arrived in, in the, in the academy, academy uh, collection? Well, unfortunately, we have scarce information concerning the arrival of manuscripts in the, in the uh, library. Sometimes if it's, uh, if it, if, uh, forms part of um, the Siladi collection, but even then it's very, not all the items of the Siladi collection have been listed. Uh, I tried to explain in the, in the 
present during my presentation that uh, uh, cataloging in the 19th century and early 20th century was done by scholars on a voluntary basis. So whatever they deemed uh, important or necessary or whatever they had time for, uh, they cataloged. But sometimes the entry stopped like one manuscript in Turkish or one manuscript in Arabic script. Mm -hmm. And then you don't know even whether it's Turkish or Persian or because the person who cataloged the donations poured in. So you should imagine the situation that the Hungarian Academy of Sciences was founded and then the library was founded and that those were the no those, those were two noble men who were so highly esteemed and regarded uh, that a number of don a great number of donations just poured in and there there was nobody to catalog. So what they did was that they entered into the log that well well manuscript and that's it so uh, that was the that was the overall situation mm. so of course if a manuscript is donated was donated by Vanberi Vanberi made sure that uh, he cataloged that particular mm. manuscript but in the case of the Silaidi collection we only know the number of manuscripts uh, and there is nothing which is inscribed in them. So there is a list, but the list which was made a, a, a report, it's called the preliminary report on the Silagi manuscript, which was made by Vanberi. But Vanberi did not sit down to catalog all the nearly 500 manuscripts. I mean, that would have been a really huge task for him. I mean, he had to travel all over Central Asia. He had no time to catalog manuscripts, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have many Ottomanists among the audience today. So the other question also goes. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, yeah <laughs> as I said, I mean, I am not an Ottomanist, so I'm <laughs> sorry for that. I, mean, I have a colleague, uh, as I told in the beginning, uh, uh, and you as well mentioned it, I'm an Arabist primarily. So um, I would love to answer questions <laughs> on the yeah. Ottoman. This so, and that. So it, it's, the other question is basically about the state of the uh, of, of 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 the Ottoman Turkish collection. Uh, what is the current state the status of yeah. the collections in terms yeah. of its availability to researchers? And yeah, to yeah, I can answer that. Effort? That's that's an easy question. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> so this is um, this is easy to answer. Uh, the collection has been cataloged. Uh, there is a printed catalog for all the Ottoman uh, manuscripts, not for the Eastern Turkish. Th this catalog does not include the Eastern Turkish manuscripts, but the Ottoman manuscripts are available. It was made by Professor Hazai, um, a noted Hungarian Turkologist, uh, in, um, uh, jointly by Ismail Parlater um, and uh, Barbara Kellner Heinkele um, a few years ago. Uh, and it was also published in Turkish. So there are two editions of this catalog, one in English and one in Turkish. And this catalog is available in print. Now, uh, the manuscripts are currently being digitized and if, uh, and several of them have already been digitized. So if anybody uh, selects a manuscript from on the basis of the catalog, he or she should get into contact with the curator of Turkish manuscripts in the library and she or he can have a, a, a copy, but the a digital copy, but the digital images are not available, not freely available online. Mm -hmm. To the best of my knowledge, uh, we have given uh, a complete series of digital images to Turkey as well. So uh, a person in Turkey can probably find the digital images there as well. But, uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I, that's what I know. But the best thing would be to get into contact with the curator of Turkish manuscripts and search the printed catalog. Thank you. Uh, there is a question about the uh, Mukri. Um, there are at least three published copies of the of Al-Mukri's text. I'm not sure which manuscripts were used for these, 
but will you be looking at other manuscript copies of the text for your article? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I know that there are at least 19 uh, manuscript uh, copies uh, in Europe, available in European libraries. I don't know anything about uh, the availability of manuscript copies uh, um, in Yemen, uh, for example, which would be very interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I know about the printed uh, versions as well. And as I have already uh, looked at other uh, manuscript copies as well. Uh, it should be noted, for example, that uh, uh, these red rule borders are an innovation because uh, in the earlier manuscripts, uh, uh, the, the text was not divided by these rule borders, uh, only by the color of the ink. So it was even more difficult probably to, to read it. Yeah, but the color, the color was the same. So black for uh, the ordinary text and the, then this red color for those texts which uh, should be read uh, uh, vertically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and of course, there are more questions about manuscripts. <laughs> One attendee asked whether there are also Syriac and Armenian and perhaps uh, Georgian manuscripts at the Academy. Yes. Uh, there are no Syriac, Syriac manuscripts. Uh, th there is a tiny uh, amount. I mean, when I said that the Arabic, man the number of Arabic manuscripts is tiny, uh, we are still talking about uh, over 300 uh, titles. When I say that the number of Armenian manuscripts is tiny, we are talking about 10 manuscripts. <laughs> so yeah, but it's minus, I mean, you can't really count it. Uh, the problem is again, uh, what was Syriac Armenian? Because we don't have Syriac, we have Armenian and what was what was the other one? Uh, Georgian. Georgian. No, we don't have Georgian uh -huh. manuscripts. No, we have a lot of Georgian books, but not no manuscripts. Uh, one of the Armenian manuscripts I know uh, is uh, quite important as um, this is a late uh, gospel, uh, but it, it in the binding there is an early specimen of an Armenian uh, manuscript fragment a parchment fragment which is bound and uh, apparently it is an early it preserves an early uh, stage of uh, the armenian language uh, mm -hmm. but the, our problem is always uh, has always been curatorship so currently we are lucky to have a person who uh, who is knowledgeable in armenian although it's not his specialty but otherwise uh, this is not a, not a field which uh, attracts a lot of research uh, in Hungary, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, whether you can give some more information about the manuscript you mentioned, El Faraj Bada Shedda. Yeah, that one has been edited. It uh, has also been edited by Professor Hazai. Professor Hazai uh, was a very keen scholar and he uh, really like to uh, bring to the forefront of research uh, uh, Turkish manuscripts from the collection. Uh, and uh, this uh, manuscript, uh, um, as I said, is not the translation of uh, uh, Tanuki's uh, uh, Arabic work, uh, but an independent collection of tales with the same uh, title. Uh, this is the only known copy and it has been edited and if uh, the person who asked this uh, question uh, looks up, uh, I th think I'm sh still sharing the slide so you can see it uh, yes. now. Uh, so I went back to this uh, uh, manuscript. Uh, as you can see on the slide, a facsimile, a transcription uh, and the transcription was published by Jared Hazai and Andreas. Andreas, sorry, the R is, I just realized that, uh, not Andreas, but Andreas Tietze. Anyhow, it was published in 2006. And uh, uh, on the basis of this manuscript, but also compared with several other manuscripts, because our 
uh, collection is particularly rich in in this uh, manuscript, which there are, I think, at least 10 different copies. Okay, thank you. There is another question in the, in the wider context of the Mukri text, uh, and I read it. I was just curious if you could tell us something about the existing manuscripts from the Sulaihid or Fatimid dynasties that you might have come across uh, during your work or any reference of those in Rasulid manuscripts? No, I am afraid not. It still awaits me this uh, step in my research. OK. Um, so uh, maybe before I turn back to Maria for the final words, there's uh, one very beautiful um, chat um, um, that we had. Oh, sorry, there is another question. <laughs> Uh, one question is whether the Faraj work is the same as the one that was published in translation recently by Ulrich Marzold. I don't think so. I think uh, Ulrich Marzold uh, published the Tanuchi version. So this okay. is not the same. Okay. Um, and uh, one question, I just sent uh, the information for everyone to the Turkish catalog and I put it in the chat so for the uh, benefit of everyone. So um, um, before I turn back to, to Maria, let me please read one a very beautiful uh, contribution in the chat. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you uh, for this revelation of source of wisdom and zealous scientific research. Kind regards from a former student of, doc of Dr. Deveni to all participants. And with this, I hand back to Maria. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, we have, I, I hope we have addressed all the questions and if there's anything else, please, please feel free um, to reach out to us. And uh, I'm pretty sure doc, uh, Dr. Devanji wouldn't mind uh, answering additional questions. Um, but at this time, we need to come to an end. I want to thank, first of all, uh, Kinga for having been with us today and for sharing the amazing uh, work that you and the library and, and everybody historically has been involved in not only providing the materials, but um, in, the, in the now times, making it digital and uh, taking care and making sure that it um, Kind of like lives lives forever. So I really appreciate uh, your work and dedication, and 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 my thanks go to you. And I also want to thank all of you that have joined us. Uh, please stay tuned for upcoming events in the areas of Near Eastern Studies and the Ital Scholarship at the Institute for Advanced Study over the course of this academic year. Um, all other events um, are listed in the relevant website pages, which are posted on the slide you can see on your screen right now. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions and if we can be of further help. Again, Kinga, thank you so very much. You addressed the digital scholarship so <laughs> on target. So I really, really appreciate um, what you're doing for, for our generation and those to come. Thank well, you all th for coming. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure <laughs> and my honor to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you.